Oh, we can start. Okay. Well, welcome. Welcome to the Critical, Critical Conversation, a multidisciplinary project on the intersection of art, race, privilege, and place. My English name is Beth Robinson. My Lenape name is Apokmuk Asasa Anahi. I hold a master's degree in dispute resolution with a focus mm -hmm. in grief and intersectional, uh, intergenerational grief and conflict. Um, my day job is the paper conservator for the Jordan Snitcher Art Museum. And I happen to be a really incredible dog walker to three beautiful Texan dogs rescues. My co-facilitator today is Megan Malone, who holds two master's degree, one in conflict dispute resolution and the other in education. She's currently working on getting licensed in social work and works at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health as a learning specialist. She has three cats who are also invited to this Zoom meeting today, Jet, Olive, and Pam. Um, before we begin, uh, we'll be doing a land acknowledgement. So honoring the native peoples and the lands. Currently this show and I are in the traditional indigenous, indigenous homelands of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coastal reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederate tribes of the Grand Ronde community of Oregon and the Confederate tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions in their communities as well as ours. And across this land, we now refer to as Oregon. We respect our, uh, we express our respect for all federally recognized tribal nations of Oregon. This includes the Burns Paiute tribe, the Confederate tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians, the Confederate tribes of Grand Ron, Community of Oregon, the Confederate tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon, the Confederate tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, and the Confederate tribes of Warm Springs, the Coquille Indian tribe, the Cow Creek Band of Umqua Tribe of Indians and the Kalamath Tribes. We also express our respect for all the other displaced indigenous people who call Oregon home and in the many lands of our panelists where they are currently residing, such as the Ho-Chek in Madison where Megan is and my own affiliation with the Len Lenape people of New Jersey and Delaware. So Megan, take us out. Thank you, Beth. Thank you for setting the tone and the intention of this space. Um, just so the audience is aware, just order of ceremonies. Um, uh, Beth and I prefer if the panelists introduce themselves and then we will jump in to questions. And um, these questions are not random. We have spent some wonderful quality time with each of them and have curated these questions to um, just out of our interests and things that they've spoken about, and we're really excited to continue the conversation. Um, if you three would like to introduce yourselves, that would be awesome. My name is Bill Rutherford. I'm a third generation Oregon. I'm black, white, and Chickasaw. My grandma had a grandmother taught on reservation before the turn of the 20th century, before they came west. When they came west, they couldn't get land because they weren't white. So they took a stagecoach from, from Bend to uh, the Dalles, and then there was no, the boat going down the river couldn't get all the way down because it was what we had to be called Cascade Rapids, which were covered by Bonneville. Then they went to sea for two days and came in at Coos Bay for Marshfield, okay? Uh, the thing is though, there was a, a lynching in what they call Coos Bay, but it was Marshfield then. Um, and this is really isn't about lynching, okay? But it's, it's documented no too. Supposedly the fellow had raped some woman, a white woman, and because of that, they hung him. It was never really 
determine whether or not that was it. So, but as far as the Rutherfords can say, my grandfather came and his brother, 1897, they came to Portland, Oregon, her barbers. Okay, at that time, blacks could either work in a Portland hotel or work on the railroad. That's enough of that, my family. Myself, we just, for the sake of simplicity, just say it. Uh, I've done a lot of things and most of them I'm proud of and I'm not wondering, and I wonder how they even happened architecturally or exhibits. But when I asked Megan about, you know, tell me about, what do you explain to me about space? And she said, whatever you want it to be. And I said, swell. But I thought about that. First, I thought about little tiny spaces. That won't work. How do I measure that? I thought about huge spaces. And how do I handle that? And I said, wait a minute. There's a space between California and Washington. And uh, let me talk about Oregon. Because Oregon is still uh, Southerners were first ones here. Southerners, by and large, still run the place. 2% of the people who live in Oregon are black. 3% are in Portland. That doesn't mean there's 5% of those people. <laughs> it didn't come out that way. So as far as I'm concerned, for me to talk about space, uh, I had to figure out, before I could talk about the use of space, I had to talk about what space was available. And, and I think I'll, I'll let the discussions go with, with the other members here before I say anything else. Okay, how'd I do? Thank you, Bill. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you, Bill. Go ahead, Anna. Okay. Uh, my name is Anna Maureen Lara, and I was born uh, in Santo Domingo in the island of Aitibo Rio, now known as Dominican Republic in Haiti, or sometimes referred to as the Española. Um, my father's people are descendants from Fon and Taino peoples, and I'm very proud of that, that I am the descendant of people who survived uh, slavery, who were Maroons, who were active resistors to colonialism during the Haitian Revolution, who have been farmers, who have been laborers and workers, and um, with my father's generation, then also um, active in fighting for the well being of their people on another level, right? In the contemporary moment. On my mother's side, I'm the descendant of, um, of Irish colonial settlers in the United States. Um, I should also mention that part of my father's people are also Sephardic, right? That, journeyed from Spain during the Inquisition to the Caribbean. And that those lineages, those memories, those conversations that have taken place in my family, the consciousness around the Inquisition and how that has shaped my understanding of who I am, how it's shaped my family's dynamics, the, dyna the memory and the history and the living stories around being farmers and laborers and descendants of the enslaved and the silences and both the spoken things that are said, all of those things shape my understanding of who I am. You know, on, on my mother's side, I've been, you know, I, I would say that I, my place in the United States gets complicated by her race and racialization and her, the way her family has benefited from generations of white supremacy. Um, and in some ways, I feel that I was born to call that all of that into question. So, um, and then on my father's family, I'm a migrant to the United States, right? So I carry both of those consciousnesses in my work and my understanding and my movement and in my, in my relationship to space, to place, to time and to language. Um, and yeah, when, I mean, when I was thinking about the question about space, I was thinking about breath. So I'll, I'm, that's where I'm gonna start my conversation. And uh, thank you for creating this conversation between us today. Thank you for taking the time.
Javier? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's an honor to be sharing this space with uh, these distinguished panelists and, and, and you. Um, I am, uh, how would I define myself and my, my interest or more about the subject of space? Um, I am Puerto Rican. Um, I, was, I was born and raised there. And that's where I have developed most of my practice, uh, both as an architect, um, an urbanist, and, and also um, an instructor, a, a teacher. And um, I, I think maybe a good way to, 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 to focus on the idea of a space, I'm, I'm going to talk about colonial space. Um, Puerto Rico is still a colony. Um, that's arguable by, by, by different people, right? Uh, but um, we, some people say we are the oldest colony in, 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 in the Western Hemisphere. Um, uh, and and that, has, that has major consequences on, on the way we live and the way that we perceive space. And, um, and maybe this is a, a reflection that I think is important. Um, Puerto Rico in general, um, seems to be like a very happy nation. Um, and, uh, and there is a lot of life that is shared by everyone in public space. So uh, I think it is public space that has facilitated uh, bringing together all of these different heritage uh, from the Taino Indians, uh, which, uh, and, and, and maybe I will, I will make a, um, an observation an observation or something that I believe and it might be might not be right, but um, Puerto Rico, I don't feel is a very segregated society. It's uh, issues of race and cultural background and, and all of that seem to play a minor role. There is of course segregation, it is social economic segregation, um, but but it is, it is this, uh, big diversity and this richness of public space that I think um, establishes a, a network or, 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 or a web of relationships that makes possible um, the, the understanding of, of Spanish colonialism to, to American colonialism, to militarism, many, many military infrastructure being built and, and, and the island treated uh, for those for those purposes, uh, and then and then being subject to many foreign um, foreign actions or, or or interventions in our land, uh, that's part of being a colony. When you are a colony, the decisions are made at the metropolis; they're not made by you. So, um, if you know from things like like how to use the land for agriculture, it was decided somewhere else. It was, it was in the interest of the Spanish crown first and then the American plantation owners that really decided how our land distribution was taking form. Um, when industri industrialization became an important uh, objective uh, for, for, for the United States and, and its, its way of dealing with, uh, with Puerto Rico, all of a sudden there was, there was a, a huge shift in the way the land was owned and organized. And, and all of that again was, was something that was, that was implanted uh, on top of a pre-existing uh, order. And, and all of that makes, makes, I think, very complex and very rich uh, things. And I would like to say, or I would like to think that it is a public space uh, the glue that has kept us together as a nation, as a culture. And, uh, and, and now that I have been for a few years um, living in the United States, I've been trying to understand my place, trying to understand the place of, of what, what makes Eugene, Eugene, how do we read our past history, the indigenous land, um, and, and all of that. So it's, it's like I'm trying to reconstruct an archaeology that sometimes is very, very difficult. And, 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 and maybe to, to, to conclude this introduction, um, as, a, as an instructor now at the University of Oregon and also 
at the Catholic University in Puerto Rico and uh, University of Puerto Rico. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a subject that I always try to, to uh, ask my students to really dwell on, um, not just architecture as a form givers uh, or, or creating spaces for specific purposes and uses, but um, how do we create uh, a space of inclusion and uh, a space of, uh, of, of, of diversity and, and saving democracy maybe, or, or anyway, uh, yeah, that's a general uh, idea of my interest and, and thanks again. Well, thank you for your introductions. I'm really excited to see where this conversation goes. And I think this foundation that you've laid forth for the audience, I hope they can see the spaces that each of you navigate and just the breadth of knowledge that is coming from the three of you. Um, you, uh, you know, we keep iterating space. What is space? What does it mean? We talk about indigenous space, black space, owning space, a work area, personal space, what belongs to us, shared space, and then reclaiming, you know, uh, when we think about a colonial history um, or, and just maybe reclaiming what our bodies are and, and how do we navigate in that time and space. Um, and one of the questions I think that kept coming up for us is um, in that belonging, um, what is appropriate or who is it for? But, and so this question goes in a bit of a different direction, but how does your art support your reclaiming of this space? And I think to a certain extent, working on thriving in this space. Well, I'll, I'll go first. Um, you know, as a poet, I think a lot about taking up space through breath and form and the body and memory. I think about the insistence of unknowable histories and the reparative work of imagination. Uh, in much of Western art, writing and poetry, indigenous and black people literally do not exist in space except as objects of conquest, slavery, genocide, rape and extraction. There's literally little to no space accorded to us on paper, among words, between the pages of books, in paintings or photographs, in sculpture or film, or even in architecture. Our voices are left out, our breath is not present, but I think that our ceremonies, our imaginations, our creativity, and our poetry which is often encased in singing and in our actual bodies through dance and movement and in the ways in which we hear and create sound, that those are spaces where the world, the knowledge, the theory and the history of our peoples take up space. And those archives, what I call archives of imagination are where the infinite possibility for our freedom and sovereignty reside. So they, these spaces of these archives of imagination help us navigate our material realities, these realities of constriction and restriction of confinement and control. Uh, differently from Javier, I experience public space in many places, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a moment, as very violent and very constricting, right? So for me, freedom is being able to walk wherever I want, whenever I want. It's not the freedom to purchase or to own property, right? Or to be a productive capitalist. Like for me, freedom is literally being able to walk um, and, and or just be present in space, right? I'm a descendant of people who survived genocide and enslavement, war, US occupation and decades of authoritarian rule. So coming from where I come from means that not following colonial rules is part of how I do things. Uh, my partner calls it maroon culture. And as an Afro Taino person who's also Sephardic, my existence means that I take up space within a history and countries that have made me extinct, right? Through paper genocide that have tried to whitewash me through official policies of blanqueamiento and that continue to perpetuate exile over generations. 
Marooning things is really important to me. In 2021, in the United States of America, there are many places where if I'm to inhabit my body and my words and their fullness and my breath and its fullness, I literally cannot walk or talk without the risk of losing my life or without having to navigate the fear of losing my life. So this tells me that we, and it is a we, not a, an I, that we are not yet free. And what this translates for me as a poet and as a performance artist, well, it tells me that we've got to maroon the situation. I have got to take up space on my own terms, even when, as Audre Lorde reminds us, that there's, even when the risk of being silenced, mutilated, or killed exists. Now, this last piece is very important. What is the purpose of digging into those archives of imagination? It's not just to take up breath in the moment. It's also to think about the culture and cultural values that we are perpetuating into the future. I ask my students, how will you actualize your cultural values for the good of Mother Earth and all of our relations now and for the future? This question is the guiding question for me in the creation of work, right? What does it mean to be free? What does it mean to perpetuate cultures of freedom into the future? And I use that, that guiding question to play with words, to take up space, to bring breath into the world through poetry and to embody my dream of a better world by walking freely, even when I'm scared for losing my life. I would like to, have you finished? I would like to say a couple of things. Um, My parents were concerned, I suspect, with space too, because they're authors of some, some legislation that changed the state of Oregon. One was miscegenation in 1951. And Martha and I, my wife, who is white, we got married in 60. And at that time, we were told we couldn't get married here. We got a supervisor who said, oh, incidentally, you don't have to go to Vancouver because, yeah, oh, by Multnomah County allows that now. In 1953, my parents were authors of legislation for uh, accommodation. Uh, but there's always ways around that for public accommodation. So that is the way I, their contribution to space. As far as I'm concerned, I used to ask them questions. Why are you doing this? And they said, we want to make it better for our people in the future. When they went off to be warehouse and various things and race in the late 90s, I asked them once again, tell me about your sacrifices because uh, Senator Hatfield was at the house, okay? Thurgood Marshall was at the house. Other people who made a difference in the world were visited with my folks. What they said was, we're sorry more of our people didn't take advantages of what was available at that time. Now the window is about closed, okay? So there's certain, I think there was a certain bitterness about who got to use what space. Now there was a, in Portland, Oregon, I'm sure I can talk about local stuff. Yeah, I understand that I'm from a race that was based on slave, slavery was based on, on rape, okay? That's a given. So when somebody says to me, African-American, I think they're talking about plywood. I mean, really, it's a consensus that somebody is, Af well, I'm, what are you talking about? That doesn't talk about anybody, it's, you know. So as far as I'm concerned of my art I make, I was making primarily art. I'm a painter and I, and I sculpt some. And I feel very honored that, uh, that the Chinooks have accepted some masks that I made, and you'll see them in Astoria. They're opened up the Maritime Museum again, a per permanent collection. I feel very honored and humbled by that. I didn't make them for that reason. I don't know why the hell I made them. Oh, yes, I do. Somebody said to me, you only make black art. Lillian Pitt said to me, you only make black art. When are you going to honor your Indian heritage? So I figured, okay, I'm going to do two things and get her off my ass. You know? However, I ended up making a collection, and... Uh, I don't really know where I'm going with that because I'm never really fully aware 
of what the space is that the work I'm trying to do will be. I'm just trying to get it out. Where it results or what resides, okay, I have no way of knowing. All I know is I feel compelled to do these kinds of things. I'm finished carving now, I'm done. I've got some things that will be shown here in Springfield in the spring. And uh, I'm gonna go back to painting because it's more reflective. Uh, it's not so, it's not so aggressive because I use machines some of the time, my work. But as far as violence is concerned, yes, I've seen violence, I've seen race riots. Matter of fact, I moved to LA to go to school in 1965, August the 19th, that's when the Watts riot started. Okay. And one thing about violence, it also smells. If you're around violence, it also puts a brassy taste in your mouth. And you don't have time to reflect on art in times like that. It's when times get quiet and when your demons come, that's when you create. I don't care what it is. Okay. So at this age, I can only, this is, these are very hard questions for me as far as the use of space. I'm a veteran, okay? I was attached to the Strategic Air Command. They could have destroyed your earth in 47 minutes. I worked in the underground headquarters, SAC, Omaha, Nebraska. But they still had segregated housing for the personnel. Uh, and there weren't any people bought, but flying those big B-52s. There was a couple of navigators who were black. The rest was white. So when, where am I going with this? All I'm trying to say is, Folks who decide on the land and how the land will be used are not generally the ones who have to do the work. Uh, and I don't know that will ever change. The younger generations seem to be more concerned about things other than space, as far as I'm concerned. I'm a great grandfather. How have we got that far? I have no idea. Okay. Uh, so where am I going with any of this? I'm just saying, it's, it's, a, it's a journey and I've appreciated those things that I've been able to see. I haven't appreciated a lot of situations I've been in, um, but I, I have no way of knowing what's gonna happen tomorrow. Okay. I have no way of planning for what's gonna happen tomorrow, how space will be used. Okay. I don't know that my personal my personal efforts are have any meaning. All I know is for some reason I had I had to make the art. I worked as a musician one time, well for a long time. And you would do work in club and if you didn't like the audience, you rehearsed, but they didn't know the difference. You know? Um, I don't I don't think I want to bore you anymore with things that I would have to say because all I'm saying is I know what history is, okay? I'm a part of that history. I've seen a transition, but I've also seen a circle. What I thought was progress, sold products, and uh, made a lot of people who, made a lot of people a lot of, a lot of money and perhaps notoriety, but it really didn't amount to much as far as mankind is concerned. And I wasn't really much, didn't worry a whole lot about mankind. I was just said those things that I could deal with, I could take care of and the rest of it didn't exist. So I'm gonna be quiet now and I'll listen to you who have real comments to make about things that are significant. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. I know Javier is going to speak in a moment more about space, but I, I'm just so struck by what you said, Bill, about violence. Violence smells, it puts a brassy taste in your mouth. And, um, you know, and just thinking about like 
you know, what, what would it, what does it, and the stories you're telling, which I'm so grateful that you're telling them, like, it's beautiful to hear your stories in relationship to the geography of Oregon. So thank you. Um, and I'm thinking about like, you know, this idea, like, how do we engage or create space without replicating the panopticon and the surveillance that historically has undermined Black life, queer life, indigenous life, right? Women's lives. Um, <laughs> that's undermined the lives of most people except those who are in the elites, right? Um, I, you know, I think about how beautiful, how much I love, and I was just talking with my partner today about how being in the United States is not having access to the plazas that we have in the Caribbean where people hang out and like sit together and listen to music together and watch people. Um, how public space is different in that sense. And then how, then I immediately thought about the fact that even in those public spaces, like my lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer friends, right? We get picked up by police. Um, if you're dark skinned, you get picked up by police, right? And so how even these spaces in our home countries where we get to look like a majority of the people that are spaces where we've we've had those experiences of being able to relax and enjoy each other's company are still surveilled spaces. Um, and, and I guess, you know, when I hear Bill talk, I think about the private home space as being the space where people have come together to like share in struggle and share in vision. When you talk about people coming home and then thinking about, you know, like literally the geography of migration and of homemaking that you talked about. So I don't know. I just wanted to reflect that back because I'm hearing that and it really moves me. Yeah. Sorry, I was I was muted before, but thank you for your intervention, Anna. I I, I thought that was that was uh, that was great. Uh, I I I feel I I feel like in an awkward position here. Because um, as an architect, uh, I am an agent of others. Um, our work is uh, is in response to to some, you know, to the system of making cities of of building, and um, and and so it is it is it is very difficult to to find to find a space to really to really address things that are that are. Uh, tremendously important, I would say. I, I guess the biggest challenge is how do we create a sense of, of belonging, a sense of ownership? Um, Bill was mentioning about spaces of violence and, and certainly, I mean, if you look at uh, even some great public spaces in terms of, of design quality and all of that, you know, they are tremendously oppressive um, and, and they are spaces of violence. Uh, I think I think you can see that in uh, in Nazi Germany, they 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 created these these incredible spaces, but they were they were really about oppression. It was about about uh, inequality. It was about it was about exclusion, and and not about inclusion. Uh, even and this is maybe from from the far left. Uh, I don't know how it belongs in this conversation, but but recently. Uh, there's there's been executive orders signed in the United States to make federal architecture be a certain style, and and it is like um, like if if architecture is is an expression of a culture, um, you know it is it is our task to 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 create a spaces and to create forms that that can 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 lead to belonging to a sense of of ownership and um, you cannot do that by imposing this type of uh, uh, external criteria so so it is it is uh, I mean because we are hired by 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 clients that uh, that demand an, an action or something that we do um, you know it's 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 a it's a difficult question sometimes I think uh, Architects or urbanists can can decide not to act. Like for instance, uh, recently, uh, the American Institute of Architects um, issued a strong letter um, 
requesting architects not to do prisons, um, you know, and just judging the type of, of the prison. I mean, so we, we do have a role as a, as a discipline to see, you know, or, or to, to act uh, collectively, to, to influence how we make these larger collective uh, decisions. In, in, in my work, I, I would say um, it's, it's maybe the issue of private property and, and understanding what things uh, belong to all or what things allow us to dwell freely um, that, that, I find, that I find very um, very rewarding and very difficult. And, and it's, it's something I'm searching for in design. Like, like um, maybe an easy way of understanding this will be, will be nature. You know, you introduce nature in public spaces. You, you try to create a, a, a balanced and, uh, and respectful relation between the man-made man uh, built environment and the natural environment. Uh, and that would be a way of being inclusive or creating a space that rejects to be owned that that rejects to be classified and 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 imprinted with these with these uh, with these qualities. Um, recently, and maybe this came by by trying to understand uh, a little bit about uh, land ownership in the United States, and specifically, I looked at uh, some areas of of, of Portland um, and how land um, how it became how it became measured and how it became part of a different system. And, um, and just, just thinking of, of maybe the, the settlements that had to do with nourishing yourself from the land, using the land as a place that will eventually embrace and, and, and create the dwelling space for not just a person or a family, but a community. Um, that, that relation was, was uh, sacred and it was uh, observed and it had to be observed by everyone. It was, it was when, when private property was imposed uh, into, these, into these different conceptions of land ownership or land systems that, um, that, that, I, think, that I think we started uh, creating barriers, creating walls. And, and these are walls that are not just physical walls, they're psychological walls. Uh, they, they are, they are uh, actions of, of dominance uh, on the land. And, and, I, and I think it is, it is our task and um, as an as a, uh, instructor of architecture in, in the school is, is our task to try to, to uh, share this, this huge responsibility, this weight uh, with all of these new uh, professionals, soon to be professionals, uh, to try to maybe maybe create a more a more human democratic uh, um, cities and, and spaces on which we can we can dwell. Won't happen <laughs> in Portland. Oh, no, just one thing. In Portland, there was a cemetery, basically Chinese. They took all their bones and they put them in five gallon cans and sent them to China. Um, I can make you some other incidents right here in Portland. That uh, I thought about being an architect when I was at the University of Oregon. Okay. I ended up designing exhibits. The only difference between the exhibits, they're still certified structures and they went 20 feet in the air and they took a bunch of goons in a couple of days to put up in industrial shows. But yeah, you're in a service industry, okay? And you serve those folks who do can write in a check, okay? However lovely the design may be by the time they get through with it, if everybody dislikes it, that's what you build, okay? But I wish you well, sir. No, thank, thank you for saying that. I, I would like to bring something um, that, that maybe, maybe can point a way of, of, of changing things. And this was, um, it was a project that was done by Teddy Cruz and Fona Foreman. Um, they, are, they are based in uh, San Diego, I believe. 
of uh, Teddy Cruz uh, of Mexican ascendancy. And uh, they created an exhibit that was uh, part of the US pavilion at the Venice Biennale. And, um, and it was about the border wall. Uh, they, were, they were exploring the border wall between the United States and Mexico. And um, what they did is uh, they studied all of the systems that um, exist in that, in that area from watersheds, indigenous lands, ecological corridors, migratory patterns, um, arguing that the border represents more a commonality and cooperative opportunity than political division. Um, I, I thought it was a beautiful work and, and it was, it was like, like helping us to understand these relations in, in a different way than maybe, maybe, and I am optimistic and I, I feel like I have to be optimistic. Uh, some, someday we, we can break these, uh, these barriers uh, that have forced us to look at things certain ways. And, and just to understand these other relations and and possibilities that live within. Yeah. I'm really struck um, kind of by the juxtaposition of private versus public, where for some that private space might allow for more freedom, but if for others, I, I think just the public space allows for freedom, but whose freedom, right? And I, you know, Anna, I'm really struck by, um, this idea of sitting, sharing music, food and existing, but it has to look a certain way, right? So going to that private space and maybe being like that, this is where I can just exist and try breathing. But then again, you got those neighbors, you got those close, you know, those neighbors next door, those cities, it's still kind of regulated, even though I think there's this concept that it's not regulated the same way. But in that, how do you heal and navigate in that at the same time? Because I think, each of you in your ways are kind of busting through the, the, the constraints that we have. And, you know, Javier, I think you're touching on it a little bit now in like looking for optimism, looking for hope. Um, so how do you balance that? How do you balance breaking these barriers and, but also healing from it? Because, you know, our armor breaks down and we got to polish it. We got to build it back up and repair it. So how do you navigate that space in healing and continuing to push? Um, I, I, would, I would say this might be a very trivial uh, way of answering your question, but is is by, by acting on it. Um, I, I, I'm just gonna um, make one little example of a project that I was involved with. And it was, it was a park, it, it was an ecological park and it was next to a housing project. Uh, this is back in my hometown in Puerto Rico. Uh, housing projects, affordable housing projects had been privatized. And part of the, part of the things that these, um, these um, administrators of these public housing projects did, they built fences all the way around it. And, um, and which is terrible. I mean, it was just accentuating the sense of segregation, you know, physical and psychological both. Um, and our park actually was happening in that place because uh, nobody could see other uses for that land because it was next to the housing project that had uh, all of these uh, social and uh, security issues, uh, this stigma. And uh, we had a big fight with, uh, with the housing people and, and the city people to try to to destroy, to turn down the barrier, the fence in between the park and the housing project. Um, we, we, didn't, we didn't win, the, the fence remained there and, um, and there was vandalism in the park. Um, the neighbors, uh, not the neighbors, the, the people that live in the housing project had cut fences, I mean, uh, openings on the fence and uh, finally, we convinced the mayor to, to make that an official thing. So we created openings. Uh, we celebrated the relation between one side and the other. And I must say that, uh, and this is again, this sounds like a, like a fictional story, but, uh, but vandalism, uh, I, I'm not gonna say that it, that it ended, but uh, it decreased significantly and, uh, and the community from the housing project started doing uh, ecological groups 
to do planting on the park and uh, a new relation was, was open. So I, I, I hope that we always find the spaces where we can act and maybe little by little create a, you know, create a difference. So anyway. I'm not sure how this applies, if I may. I'm sorry, I've spoken out of turn. Um, last year, the city of Portland uh, named a park for my mother, City Park. Uh, it's in Northeast Portland and my parents were really active in civil rights in the 50s. Um, and for me to go there, we went there, we were on the way to a show I had the Dalles, and we stopped at this park, Verdell Verdine Park. It's about off 160th and Gleason or somewhere out there. And I didn't say anything to my wife or my daughter and son-in-law who had really were driving. You get my age, you put in a sit back, you sit in the back seat a lot, you know. Um, how her efforts to do for civil rights in the city of Portland, um, how that, how that, I remember one time my, my mom on the dining room table with a, a large pad of paper and two, and two number two pencils started the NAACP credit union on the dining room table. Um, but never said much about any of that stuff. Now here's, they've given her name to uh, several acres of, of a public park with children's things and all the rest of that. And I'm thinking, now I, there was no way in her life she would ever have thought that somebody would name something after her. It would have been the last thing she would have thought of. Because you open the front door and she would start laughing when our daughters would go through the door. And it's in a neighborhood where I really feel there are no black people living anyway. Okay. But to think that I, I'm not sure where I want to, where I want to go with this on the fact that what sometimes seems insignificant ends up having some kind of importance somewhere, even when it's not intended to. Okay. Um, I, I understand, I understand the difference between what we wish for and why we wish for it in the actual results of who generally is decided by those who really don't care that much about it one way or the other, except it's not the way they want it. Um, as an exhibit designer, I would sit down with clients and these were things that took time. These were structures and some official's wife, a bureaucrat's wife would have she took basic design so she knew how the whole thing went together, okay? And I understand the negotiations you have to go through the size of kind of projects you do. Um, as far as the compromise, as far as Megan's talking about being able to appease one side, compromise with the other side and solve the problem, um, everybody, Everybody loses, but everybody gains. Now, how does that make any sense to me? And I said it. I don't know if the ideal, the solution ends up being a compromise that people will live with. And so there's sometimes some benefits that aren't even planned for that come out and end up being what you wanted to do anyway. Okay. And I can appreciate your position in the position you're in when you're dealing with clients and governments and regulations and the influence, those who influence things that you don't see. Um, uh, I empathize with you, sir. Um, uh, when design ends up being the least of it. Um, I think, um, To me, the service industry, irrespective of what that means, uh, has to always deal with those folks who decide. Those who really, the ones you don't see, the ones you don't meet. Okay. 
the ones that we're dealing with right now or trying to fix what we've been dealing with here right now. I had a heart, okay, I'm gone aside. I had, as far as space is concerned and use for space, I had a real problem dealing with the fact that the kind of work I did as a vet, okay, military intelligence, a regional oxymoron, and then you had a, an official who ends up being a KGB agent, even though he's supposed to be president of the United States. I have a problem with that, but somebody still decided, told that dummy what to do. And he, you don't see. And so how do you deal with that? How do you, how, tell me how it works now in the 21st century. As an architect, you're a professional. You have professional things you think are best solutions for whatever the client wants. And somehow somebody decides because they have more power. Okay. How do you get around that? How do you teach that? How, how do you deal with those kinds of things when somebody wants to do something different with the space than the space is actually ideally designed for? I'm going to try to jam you up. Don't misunderstand. But I haven't been around professional anybody for, for a long time. Okay. So the space, once again, we're talking about space. Who owns that space? What elite owns that space? Okay. How do you appease them when you can't pull their tongue out and run a darn needle up through it? Okay. How do you deal with that? How can we deal with it? How can I apply it? How can I apply those kinds of reasonings to any day-to-day -day situation that I'm hey, I'm retired. I'm out of it. But it still bothers me. And I have no invested interest. I got a little house on a side street that doesn't go anywhere. Okay. How do you explain how the real world works to your students? I almost went to Taliesin West when I was 15. That's when those other architects were talking about modern design, and you had these Vanderbilt, those folks. Still, look, it looked like Japanese architecture to me, but what do I know? So you're going up off the ground now, and you're dealing with architecture here in the States and in your home country, okay? okay. How is it any different other than the language? Explain to me how you're going to deal with that. How many compromises do you have to make to deal with the space? Make the space work for all those things that you would hope it would work for. Okay. I'm an old man. I don't matter. Explain it to me. Give me the knowledge, sir. Your wisdom, sir. You know, I mean, I, 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 I totally understand your, your, your questions and how, how, how deep they are and how difficult it is to deal with it. Uh, I, I maybe I have a, a easy way out from this very difficult position you have put me on. Um, what I would really like to do is uh, run for mayor. That's uh, it's Portland it's, needs you. <laughs> yeah. Pardon? Yeah. Sorry. A anyway. Uh, so so these these questions that you're asking has uh, has uh, gotten me into into going into land use law, into urban law, into many other different uh, approaches to this because I realized how difficult and how these invisible actors are actually the ones, you know, um, acting and defining the space that we can work on or, or not work on. Um, so it is, it, is, it is very difficult and, and I'm, I'm going back to, to what I said earlier, and I don't see, I don't say it as a naivete. Um, I, I, I am a, an optimist. I, I, I see a lot of positive things. Um, and I, I just try to, to dwell on that and maybe, maybe raise um, a difficult awareness. You, you asked me 
how do I act here as opposed to back in my home? And um, that, is, that is a good question. And I will tell you, I don't feel uh, enfranchised to work here. I, I, don't, I don't feel I really belong. Um, this goes back to the colonial question. Um, uh, as a Puerto Rican, uh, I am a US citizen. But culturally, I have a very, very different background, and and uh, and that makes me feel very, very strange in 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 exerting these kind of uh, ideas in into the society. Back home, I feel totally empowered to do that and to and to make my voice be heard. Um, here, it, it maybe works in academia. It's. Uh, uh, and maybe maybe I'm using academia as a refuge to 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 feel like I'm you know doing something or 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 seeing new possibilities. Um, but but certainly, it's, uh, thank you for asking all of these questions. This is uh, very difficult. Thank you for answering them, sir. I didn't mean to jam you up. I really didn't. You know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Well, Bill, Bill often asks really hard questions that Megan and I even left his company thinking a lot about a lot of different things. I think um, one of the things I loved reflecting on hearing all of you is the way that you weave the narrative of your identity into your art, into the way you'd like the world to be the hope of it, and also those hard questions. Because um, I myself have been there where I'm like, why am I doing this? Will it help anyone? How do I heal from it? Is it just for me? Is this for an audience? Um, and as a person that works in our archives, I, I loved what Anna said about the, the archives of imag imagination being able to reconstruct these spaces. And living in Europe for a while and then coming back to the United States, I felt the same way that there was these collections of spaces where different people could come and be together. And then when my Italian friends would come to America, they'd be like, okay, let's go to the city center. And I'm like, there is, the, like the United States doesn't do that. You know, that, that's private, that's someone else's space. And, and like one of you had referred to the living, that like our living rooms became that space. Even Bill talked about his mom at the dinner, at, at the dinner table, creating new spaces with finances, right? And, and all the different conversations that happen uh, at, at Americans' dinner tables, uh, if they even have food sometimes these days. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. It's 1.58. And Megan, I don't, do, you, do we want to ask them if they want to leave us with one, one last bit of, of this wonderful conversation? Yeah, I mean, if you feel called to share one last little bit to close things out, I offer you for you to share that. Um, I'm just really... I've been kind of stunned in this hour, frankly, listening to the three of you speak. Um, so many questions and so many just nuggets of information for me to ruminate. I hope the audience is feeling that too. Um, so that's kind of just been my reaction to all of this. Um, so I thank you for that, that opportunity to listen. Um, but, you know, if there's just one piece that you would like to offer up, um, I would be grateful for that. I would. I'll be real fast. Tell, and I did, this isn't mine, okay? If I ask you to clear your voice and swallow, you wouldn't have a problem with that. If I ask you to expectorate into a glass and now drink it, it's how you look at it, right? How you don't look at it. How you don't have to look at it. That's all I got. Thank you for all of you for letting me be a part of this. And, um, I'll read a poem that's actually part of the exhibit. Um, I wrote this after the, <clears throat> after the decision came down for George Zimmerman after the murder of Trayvon Martin. Uh, and this was a while back. And 
the newspapers um, simultaneous to reporting on Trayvon Martin's death talked about a dog named Big Boy that was wandering through the neighborhood. So this poem is called Big Boy and it's for Trayvon Martin and his family. The first time the dog ran free, it searched the bushes for scraps of meat, perhaps a piece of fruit. Not that he was hungry, he was simply a dog. Victory at the bend, the perfect loot, a rind of watermelon, a pork bone, still warm. The second time the dog broke loose, he returned to the sight of riches. A man peered through the window, following his every move, noting how he growled at squirrels, still a dog. Busy with the chicken bones and bread, he did not notice the man or the noose. The third time the dog jumped the gate, he wandered cautiously, left the neighborhood ending up at the corner store. He walked home with half a hot dog, saliva dripping from his jaw. He was fulfilled. And it was in that moment, that brief taste of bliss, a dog eating a hot dog, that the man unrelenting called his name and he turned, the bullet killed him instantly. So that's for Trayvon Martin and, and the fact that in, our, in the US society, we often accord more respect to dogs than we do to black children. And um, just thinking about space and the ways in which we can and cannot walk through spaces. And yeah, that's all I got. To, that's all I got. That's my story and I'm sticking to it, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was profound. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. Uh, um, maybe just um, more than a last thought is maybe a, a, an invitation to everyone to embrace public space, to use it as a space of uh, cultural and uh, an artistic uh, expression, and um, it claim it. It's uh, it's 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 ours for 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 that or for protesting or for anything that binds us as a society. Thank you, Javier. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder um, that, that we are a country that is built on that pay, supposed public space that we can come to and demand our democracy. Um, I want to thank each one of our panelists today. Uh, your time with us has been so precious. And the hour that you spent with us in the beginning was so precious. And um, uh, again, Megan and I want to reiterate again from yesterday is that the only regret we have about this is that we were not able to sit with you in your space and break bread with each one of you and all of us together at a big table. That, that was like our dream, right, Megan? <laughs> like, oh my God, I want to be at a table with all these guys. So, so hopefully once COVID's over, we can do that. Any last words from you, Megan? No, I just, I am just, I'm still sitting in it. I'm, um, I just am really appreciative of the opportunity to sit with each of you and um, just sharing that space has meant a lot to me, especially in a time like COVID when we are all social distancing and I've learned so much and felt a lot and I really just appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Beth and Megan. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Agnes will tell.